is Alison Gill. I'm a professor in the Department of Geography at Simon Fraser University in Vancouver in Canada. And what I'm going to talk to you about today is sustainability and the politics of place in resort destinations. I'm going to talk about the work that I've been doing with my colleagues in the mountain resort of Whistler, British Columbia. And you can see a picture of that in this initial slide. The context of, of what I'm going to talk about is really the battle, really, if you like, between growth and sustainability that is happening in destinations. And it is in a much larger context of really other sectors and, and, and the politics of place generally. So these two quotes that I've put up for you here, first about neoliberalism, which of course is the dominant uh, um, mode in, in capitalist economies. And the important thing about neoliberalism is the growth, growth first approach is at the key. And so we have a lock-in, if you like, to public sector austerity and growth chasing economic development. So on the one hand, we have neoliberal liberalism. On the second side of things, we have from the past uh, a lock-in to the conceptual and institutional separation of social and ecological systems. And consequently, um, the way that governance works in these contexts means that it's very difficult to actually move towards sustainability. So that's sort of the context to bear in mind as I talk about the, the example from our own research in Whistler. Just a very quick outline to, to frame this. Um, I've given a little introduction to the, the, the conflict and contestation between growth and sustainability. And I'm going to talk then about the theoretical or conceptual framework within which we've been looking at this work. The idea of path, the development of, of path constitution, path dependency and path creation, which comes out of evolutionary economic theory and its various adaptations to other disciplines. Then looking at the path to sustainability in Whistler, in British Columbia, and then drawing together some conclusions um, about how we're moving towards or hoping to move towards sustainability and what are some of the challenges of doing so. So first of all, in in terms of the forces of path constitution, I have a little model up there which puts the constraints and the catalysts of change in opposition. And it is these two contestations that meet in, in terms of resort governance. On the one hand, we have the constraints, the path dependency, that is the difference that history has made. History matters because we set up institutions, we develop values, political systems, and so forth. And we develop lock-in. And there are various types of, uh, of lock-in, which take political form, social form, and institutional form. Uh, and these carry on. And so those forces, when change, and in this case, we're looking at moving from dependency on growth towards changes that are broader than thinking about economic growth, but embed, of course, society and environment in our considerations through ideas of sustainability. And some of the recent research has been attempting to identify what these new paths are looking like, the paths towards sustainability, because, of course, sustainability is really a process rather than an end goal. And the focus of path creation, and this is a particular research lens, looks particularly rather at institutions, um, as path dependency studies do, on human agency in particular, and tries to understand the effects that human agency, and particularly how entrepreneurs and so forth, um, affect change. These in turn, the, these two forces, two ideas, two perspectives, often find contestation in the actual resort governance context. And so that's basically the, the form that, um, the, the context and the framework for what our study is about. And there again, you see another photograph of Whistler, a mountain resort north of Vancouver. Um, I'm not going to go into all the details about Whistler. Those of you who ski will know all about it. Um, it's the largest, most successful mountain resort. It's an all-season resort in North America, north, 120 kilometers north of Vancouver. And what's important to note, though, is that since 1975, it's a brand new resort, as a brand new, um, 30 years old, comprehensively planned new resort with municipal government um, from the start and with comprehensive planning. It had a planned limit to growth. That limit to growth was reached around the years 2000. And it's this planned reaching of capacity that really has led to this uh, debate within the resort about um, growth versus 
sustainability and the shifting of the discourse from growth to sustainability through path creation. I bring he in here two concepts of, of the lens of path creation, the notion of mindful deviation. If we're going to move towards sustainability from growth models, it needs to be mindfully deviated. We need to actually take action, mental specific action. We also need to take into account when to act and the notion of real time influence. And one of the key human agents was a visit by a person called Carla Henri Crabert, the founder of an organization called The Natural Step, which is a not-for-profit sustainability education organization that has had global impact um, in terms of both corporate and increasingly community sustainable development uh, advances. So here we have the human agent. The second thing that was important was that he came to Whistler actually as a visitor, um, but talked to a number of the people in local government. And it was at a time when the local government was really wondering what to do next. They wanted to address the limits to growth, but they didn't quite know how they were going to move forward. And they'd been very progressive in thinking about environmental management, but the notion of, of considering both uh, the social aspects as well were really a, um, a problem as to how to actually move towards sustainability. Sustainability conceptual is obviously a wonderful idea, but how do you take the next step towards implementation? So we have human agency and mindful deviation and real-time influence. What happened was something that is also very important in moving and shifting ideas towards sustainability, and that is something we've termed community conditioning. It's actually the education part of sustainability. Sustainability being a very fuzzy concept is one, one that is differently interpreted by different bodies of people and in different places. So educating people about the concepts of sustainability and what it actually means is a very important part of that journey along that path. So community conditioning. In fact, it took not only two years of very intense engagement with the community, but actually five years to come up with the actual policy plan, which you see in the picture, that's the, the cover from the, the policy document, Whistler 2020. And that was, was the document that was a high-end policy uh, document that was developed by the community, through the community, that actually Im embedded the ideas of the natural step approach into a, a, a policy that fitted the destination. The key thing about this is that instead of government, uh, where you have local government to make decisions, in this particular approach, we see governance in a much broader sense, in which task forces with various stakeholders and interested people were looking at every decision made in the community and suggesting action with understanding of what sustainability meant across this much broad, not just environmental, but across the social and economic implications of all decisions. It was a document and a policy that has been caught a lot of attention globally in other tourist destinations. Simultaneously with developing this, however, some other change, critical change event occurred, and this was the um, granting of the Winter Olympics in Whistler as the, as the downhill um, event site for the Whistler uh, 2010 Winter Olympics. Winter Olympics, the, the, the International Olympic uh, Committee, also had sustainability as their agenda. So now, in looking through this path creation lens, we see entrepreneurs. You have visionaries, like, like the founder of The Natural Step, but for entrepreneurs you, who are able to take new ideas and innovations, we need to have people of action. And there's a definition there of what entrepreneur is changing endogenized social practice, what's in place, regulations or in institutions away from the accepted, comfortable, or optimized structure. That, as I suggested, is, is something that's not always easy to do. And here are the two leading uh, people who, who took this idea forward. The mayor himself, who was a very passionate advocate of, of sustainability ideas and co very committed. And Jim Godfrey, who was a chief administrative officer who had great strategic knowledge and knew how to play politics and, and, and governance approaches. That all went very well. 2010 Olympics was highly successful. Everyone congratulated themselves. Whistler did indeed, uh, in terms of tourist destinations around the world, get great attention to their sustainability policy. But one year later, the mayor who had been a major entrepreneur and proponent, and his entire council, who had been quite sustainability 
pro-sustainability was completely voted out of office and a new mayor and council um, withdrew, stepped back from the sustainability agenda. Whistler 2020 is still a high level policy, but it actually changed everything and reverted back to a much more traditional model of decision making by the council and focusing attention on economic growth. So what happened and why was this path of sustainability brought to at least a, a serious roadblock? Well, I've titled the conclusions to beyond protective space. And the idea of protective space is that when one has innovations, um, when things are in sort of incubation stage, as, as this, this new approach to sustainability governance was in Whistler, um, it had the protective space of the Olympic Committee. Um, it had the protective space, in fact, that everything that was focused on trying to get to the Olympics and do it with a sense of urgency, because you can't be late for the opening of the Olympics, um, that everyone was, was working around the same principles. And it had the, the blessing, if you like, of higher level authorities. So everyone was on board with it. But after the Olympics were over, that protective space and bubble actually went away. At the same time, at the destination, the Whistler had been protected very much from the 2008 global recession in the lead up to the 2010 Winter Olympics. Um, but after the Olympics, suddenly uh, visitor numbers were down and there was a great deal of pressure on the on businesses and, and the sector. So while the rest of the world was, had really suffered earlier, we were protected by the, the Olympics. With the loss of the people in local government who were champions of sustainability, the entrepreneurs supporting it were also lost, so we lost the champions. And also much of the learning that had gone on, the many public meetings and, and the engagement with notions of sustainability that had happened over quite a, almost well, eight years at least, um, were also withdrawn. Money was taken away that supported that. So these protective spaces were gone. So just some final thoughts then on what happened to the politics of place, because essentially the change was a political one. I like this quote from an American philosopher from the 1880s, William James, and he long ago said, the community stagnates without the impulse of the individual, and the impulse dies away without the sympathy of the community. So human agency, in other words, it's all very well having promoters and leaders and entrepreneurs, but you also need to get the social license to operate from the community. So you need the broader human agency, the collective human agency. But then there are also some sobering thoughts about what any journey towards sustainability is, regardless of where it is or, or really what sector it is. But the dominant form of governance in Western capitalist economy is representative democracy that favors short-term gains over long-term responsibility because politicians' jobs depend on meeting the immediate needs of the voter. And consequently, the suggestions are that we have to possibly rethink some aspects of basic democracy and the way in which we go. So there are many, many hurdles to face, but on the positive side, certainly in the case of, of Whistler, they have made step forward. Um, one hopes that as the economy improves, that indeed they may go back to actually engaging in a, in a broader sense of governance with, with more input from a broader um, group of stakeholders that doesn't just focus as it's been drawn to, to just any economy. Thank you. Just give you some, some references here um, that I don't know if you can read them. I'll leave them on for a few moments before I uh, say um, thank you for listening to me. And I hope that some of this has been useful to you. I put in here a couple of references to the basic uh, notions from evolutionary economic research on path creation that guided some of the work that we've been doing. Thank you. Mm -hmm.